At the time I'm writing this video essay, it's very cold in some parts of my country. Climate change deniers point to their regional snowstorm as proof of their worldview while ignoring the fact that the world in general is getting increasingly hotter. Factors that come into play for regional weather are Earth's seasons, ocean patterns, upper winds, Arctic sea ice, and the shifting shape of the jet stream. These factors can lead to extreme weather in various portions of northern mid-latitudes. A local cold day does not disprove the calculable long-term increasing of global temperatures. The fact that the Earth is getting warmer is a demonstrable fact that cannot be ignored simply because snow still exists in 2019. Nobody ever claimed it wouldn't. In fact, even record snowfall would not disprove climate change. To claim that snowfall is inconsistent with a warming world only displays a lack of understanding of the link between global warming and extreme precipitation. Warming causes more moisture in the air which leads to more extreme precipitation events. This includes more heavy snowstorms in regions where snowfall conditions are favorable. Record snowfall was actually predicted by climate models and is consistent with the expectation of more extreme precipitation events. Climate and weather are different things. But here's the problem. No matter how much science you show, the deniers and those who are simply apathetic to climate change and other environmental disasters will choose to ignore it because... Science is a liar sometimes! Oh boy. Sometimes you have to explain it to people as if they were children, and fortunately for us, the films of Hayao Miyazaki do just that. His films touch upon environmental issues. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind not only features a protagonist with a love of nature, but a dire warning about how nature is not always benevolent and that it could very well be our downfall if we choose to ignore environmental concerns. Miyazaki himself has said, The idea that nature is always gentle and will give birth to something like the Sea of Decay in order to restore an environment polluted by humans is a total lie. And I believe that the idea that we should cling to such a saccharine worldview is a big problem. Miyazaki's even more famous work, Princess Mononoke, broaches this subject as well. In the film, Ashitaka becomes involved in a conflict between the gods of the forest and the humans who consume its resources. By displaying the conflict in mythological terms and through allegory, Miyazaki teaches us these lessons not through complex environmental science, but in language that even a child can understand. If you take too much from the forest, the gods begin to die, and a curse is upon you. If you are not conscientious of our real-world environment, there are real-world consequences. Ashitaka encounters a Tataragami, but what is it? In the book Liquid Life, William R. LaFleur explains, It involves a revenge-seeking spirit who, bearing a grudge against those who had wronged him, takes a retaliatory action from his position among the dead. A good deal of Japanese ritual life apparently has its origin in the fear that, unless rituals are performed, a maligned god will exercise baneful influence on the living. If humanity is destroying nature and making it inhospitable for both animals and themselves, then the Tataragami, a vengeful spirit, represents consequences. More specifically, the curse is the consequence of human ignorance, of human greed, both things that destroy the forest. If Ashitaka were to kill Iboshi, this would empower the curse and kill him even sooner. Even if he survived, he would become a human Tatarigami, an embodiment of the vengeance on humanity. According to Eric Reinders, author of The Moral Narratives of Hayao Miyazaki, his only way out is to pursue absolute equanimity, the Buddhist virtue of even-mindedness, an emotional calm which refuses to be repelled by or attached to either pain or joy. Buddhism, like many Eastern traditions, does not make a distinction between nature and humanity. We are not set apart from nature, much in the way that the spirits and gods of the film are not so much supernatural as they are interconnected with the natural. The Buddhist doctrines of karma and of rebirth put all of human life in the context of an endless series of cycles, which resemble those which operate in the natural world, such as the food chain or the Calvin cycle in photosynthesis. Buddhism focuses on impermanence. Everything is fleeting. Buddhism has been stressing what environmental science has begun to tell us, that nature is not a boundless well of resources, and our actions have an effect on the world. The doctrine of karma tells us that our actions are in proportion to the greed and apathy that motivates them. Put simply, this means that stripping the planet of its resources and causing other adverse effects on our environment causes dire consequences. 
Outside of the realm of religion, we know through practical science that we have a deleterious effect on the earth. But Miyazaki shows us this through spirituality, through folklore, and through fantasy. Two gods have dominion over their representative animals, Maro and Okuto, the giant wolf and the giant boar, respectively. The apes also speak, but there is no giant ape among them. Iboshi claims, without the ancient gods, the wild ones are mere beasts. The apes can still speak, but their voices are slow, their grammar is weak, and they exist mostly in the distance, as if they are fading away. The giant boar sadly laments that his boars no longer speak, and when he is near death, the giant wolf says, Can you not even speak now? We can hypothesize that a giant ape god had been killed, and since the apes bear much animus for humanity, it's possible it was the humans who were responsible, either deliberately by killing it or indirectly by ruining the forest. The apes speak of humans destroying the forest, and the consequences are that these speaking apes are losing their magic, their speech. The boars appear to be next. The giant boar says, Look on my tribe. We grow small and we grow stupid. To go on in this manner is to end as game the humans hunt for meat. This is, of course, exactly what will happen. Princess Mononoke is a precursor to our real world, when animals will not only be hunted, in some cases to extinction, and in other cases cultivated through factory farming for mass production and mass slaughter. And what of the deer? According to Japanese folklore, deer in Nara, at the foot of Mount Wakakusa, are considered sacred due to a visit from a god. There is also an old Japanese folk dance in which the dancers wear antlers. The humans in the film, with no reverence whatsoever, fire at the deer. The fact that this deer god, this spirit of the forest, does not speak while other gods can speak may be related to the fact that the forest is dying. The forest has been damaged by and encroached upon by humans. If the apes can barely speak due to having no more god, and when a god is near death they do not speak, the fact that the deer does not or cannot speak may be telling. San is so disenchanted with humanity that she refuses to see the truth, that she herself is a human and not a wolf. And why should she identify with humanity? She lives a life devoid of the trappings of humanity. More important in this distinction, she respects the spirit of the forest, whereas the humans, like Iboshi, clearly do not. So, it's perhaps easier to show the consequences of the damage we are doing to our environment through film because the full breadth of what we have caused is not apparent. It only becomes more in focus after it's too late. Visualizing what's in store for us could be helpful. For some, the science will not be enough. Only stories will do. Hi everyone, thanks for watching this week's episode. If you'd like to contribute to the show, please click on the Patreon link. And if you just want to subscribe, go ahead and do that. But remember to click that notification bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next week.